Psychodynamic theory is a theory that generally assumes that the root of behavior is unconscious motives and conflicts. Um, and this is typically based on past experiences. Childhood plays a very large role in uh, current adult behaviors. So psychoanalysis began with a man called, or kind of had its beginnings, I suppose, in uh, a neurologist called Jean Charcot. Uh, he was a French neurologist and is considered the founder of modern neurology by some. And he studied what he called uh, hysteria, which was a female disorder marked by paralysis, blindness, deafness. So physical causes that had no clear biological basis. So he believed that they had um, a basis in the mind and um, was able to, to treat successfully some people with hypnosis. So during hypnosis, they would experience uh, recall traumatic experiences, and he noted that after this hypnosis, sometimes the symptoms would disappear. As well, there was a gentleman, uh, Josef Brewer, who had a patient, Anna O, oh, who's a famous patient. Um, she had hysteria, symptoms that emerged after the death of her father. Um, and during one sort of trance that she would experience, you described these um, situation in which there was an emergence of one of her symptoms. When she woke up from this trance, um, the symptoms had disappeared. So this was um, kind of these two individuals in general were um, building evidence that there was something uh, maybe psychological in, in some of these uh, cases and that um, there may be treatments for these different psychological uh, so psychoanalysis was essentially one of the very first psychological treatments. And then Sigmund Freud came along and he's a little bit more famous. Um, so he was influenced heavily by Charcot and Brewer and he initially treated patients with high hypnosis as well, but noted that some patients were not very easy to hypnotize um, as well. Some were not able to remember what happened during hypnosis and therefore couldn't have the benefits of hypnosis. So Freud noticed that putting his hand on the head of the patient as they laid down on his couch um, was just as effective. And then eventually noticed he didn't even have to have that hand, that the active ingredient seemed to be just talking. So he had what he called like the talking cure, uh, where he would have people just talk about whatever was on their mind um, and found that this appeared to be effective with some of his patients. The underlying basis of psycho, uh, Freud's theory of um, in psychoanalysis is that uh, everything that a person does has meaning and purpose. So even a lot of things which don't seem to be meaningful, intentful, or have um, a purpose do. And he believes that uh, conscious behavior is um, not very problematic, but that most disturbed behavior is caused by this unconscious motivation. And the unconscious motivations are uh, instincts, which is energy that makes humans function. Um, and there are two main instincts. There's the life instinct and the death instinct, also known as Eros and Thanatos, which I believe is based in uh, Greek mythology. So the life instinct is the basis for all the positive and constructive aspects of behavior, whereas, uh, oh, such as like hunger, thirst, sexual interest, creativity, things that drive people to do things that are productive and positive. Um, and death is the destructive impulse, um, and it's um, the cause for destructive aspects of bodily urges and creativity, so the excess of a lot of these things. It accounts for the dark side of human behavior and is not um, as much a focus of modern um, psychoanalysts, so the life impulse is more relevant in modern psychoanalysis. Freud's three basic personality structures that uh, he believed drove human behavior were the id, the ego, and the superego, and a lot of people might be familiar with this. This is classically demonstrated through this um, iceberg um, graphic, so everything that's above the surface are things that are guided by um, conscious like conscious consciousness um, and conscious behavior, whereas everything that's below the water is guided by the unconscious. So the id is below the water, it's guided by, it's kind of like the pleasure principle. Um, so it's guided by the unconscious and this is the id is made up by instinctual urges looking for immediate gratification or relief of tension. So for example, um, the urge for sex, urge to eat, drink, urinate. 
um, and there are no values, ethics, or logic. It's just that there's discomfort and it must be relieved as quickly as possible. So this is the pleasure principle. And then primary process is the urge to immediately expend energy. The ego is like one step up. It's organized rational system that mediates the demands of the ego. I'm sorry, of the id and, la and later the superego. It's kind of like the reality principle. So um, through the ego, one is able to defer gratification until an appropriate time and place. So for example, if a person's hungry, they don't immediately grab um, the first piece of food they see. They wait until lunchtime and eat the food that they brought for lunch. Secondary process is part of the ego, and this involves learning, memory, planning, judgment, all the cognitive functions, um, as well as decision making to manage the demands of the id and also kind of mitigate um, some of the demands of the superego. So superego um, is sort of the um, conscience. It's like the, the human ideal of morality. Um, Ideals and, value, ideals and values of society are conveyed onto the child by the parents through our development, and this is where the superego is developed. Uh, it's reinforced by rewards, which um, manifest as pride and worthiness, and punishments, uh, like moral punishments, which manifest as shame and feelings of worthlessness. It blocks unacceptable id impulses and also pressures the ego to adhere to morality and strive toward perfection. And so um, ego at times is very, very logical and ego would drive someone to do the most logical thing at that time. But sometimes the most logical thing is not necessarily the most moral thing. Um, and so the super ego um, is kind of able to bring the person's functioning up another level to consider um, moral and ethical implications of behavior. Freud's theory of the psychosexual stages of development is important because um, people at that time really weren't paying attention to childhood as an important period of psychological development. People kind of thought of children as like little uh, immature adults that you just kind of waited until they were real adults. Um, and Freud really brought a lot of attention to how experiences during childhood and normal development formed the foundation of adult psychological functioning. So while this theory of development really doesn't have much scientific basis and very few people that I know actually find it to be valid currently, it was just very important as kind of a primary attempt at understanding childhood and psychological development. So Freud believed that chi uh, children, uh, childhood does shape character and personality, and that children go through these stages, and that these stages are linked to erogenous zones of the body, so uh, parts of the body that are sensitive to sexual stimulation. So Freud's psychosexual stages of development. First would be oral, where mouth is most important for satisfaction. This is during the first year. You can see how this kind of tracks um, babies put everything in their mouth, although notably that extends past the first year. Um, Two-year-olds are also putting everything in their mouth. Uh, the anal stage attention is on urination and defecation, so in modern children this would be kind of the pre-potty training stages and throughout potty training. And then phallic stages, sexual organs become the source of gratification, and that's roughly ages three to seven. Uh, this is the Oedipal complex. Oh, this is um, so you might have heard of the Oedipal Complex. Uh, and this is kind of what Freud is famous for because it, it does seem so sort of bizarre and out of left field and doesn't isn't really supported by any sort of modern research or modern conceptualizations of children. But um, Freud believed that boys develop sexual desire for the mother because of this hate and want to kill the father because he's um, like competition. Uh, but he has to accept his inability to compete with the father because the father is bigger um, and castration anxiety comes out of this. So the idea is the boy is literally afraid that the father is going to castrate him. So to resolve this conflict, he um, boy aligns with the father. And this is why um, this is kind of how boys develop into manhood or learn to become a man. On the flip side, girls develop penis envy. Um, because they also want to possess their mother. They also have sexual desire towards the mother. Um, then they shift their sexual desire toward the father and accept femininity, um, replacing penis envy with interest in bearing children or having a husband. Yeah, um, latency is 
um, lack of overt sexual activity, so kind of a um, latent period or um, period during which there there isn't much um, psychosexual development, ages 5 to 12, roughly, and then the genital phase is a mature expression of sexuality, and that's from adolescence or around puberty into adulthood. Um, so in psychosexual stages of development, difficulties at any stage can later be expressed as maladjustment, and we'll talk about that a little more specifically. Um, but essentially, it's it's a um, it's a series of development stages that must be moved through for normal development. Excessive frustration or overindulgence at any stage will lead to problems. Um, not engaging in a stage will lead to problems, and character formation. Um, results from these stages. So some examples of character formations that may occur from um, dysfunction during one of the psychosexual stages. In an oral stage, uh, someone if someone didn't properly resolve oral stage, they could be a smoker or um, engage in um, excessive uh, oral activities like gum chewing. Um, you might have heard the term oral fixation and this comes uh, from Freudian theory. In the anal phase, uh, if this is unresolved, somebody could be obsessively clean and organized, or on the flip side, really reckless and disorganized. Um, so if you've heard uh, that somebody is like anal retentive or somebody's anal, that's where that term comes from. In the phallic stage, uh, if this is improperly resolved, men become overly aggressive, ambitious, and vain, or women who don't resolve penis envy strive to dominate men and become seductive. Um, assuming, I suppose, that seduction is the only way that women can dominate men, or they might, on the flip side, become unusually submissive. In the latency phase, um, if this isn't maneuvered through properly, there may be difficulties with sexual fulfillment in adult life, and in the genital phase, um, unsatisfactory friendships and romantic relationships, so kind of core relationship issues can occur if there are difficulties during the genital phase. Freud was a genius within his time and set the groundwork, very important groundwork, for later psychotherapeutic theories. However, he was a product of his time. He was a man, a white man, living in Austria. Um, and living in a world where heterosexuality was considered a problem. And his theories reflect these ideas. So one of the major criticisms that Freud has had is that his theories are patriarchal, misogynist, androcentric, and don't uh, respect women as equal to men. And I believe that there is a lot of um, justification for considering Freud to be this way. So there's been a lot of criticism of his approach to women recording sexu uh, reporting sexual abuse, not taking that seriously or putting some of the blame on the, um, the women or the girls who are experiencing sexual abuse. He pretty consistently portrays women and very explicitly portrays women as a broken or deficient man. He explicitly did not consider men and women to be equal. Um, an example of this would uh, is this excerpt: "Girls do not hold their mother responsible for the for girls hold their mother responsible for their lack of a penis and do not forgive her for their being put thus at a disadvantage." So he explicitly considered a lack of penis to be a disadvantage. Um, penis, his idea of penis envy suggests that women who do not wish to bear children or marry men are development, developmentally abnormal, which I think would be problematic. In modern time, many women choose to be with um, female partners or not have a partner, not bear children, and I, this would not be considered by most to be abnormal or problematic as long as um, it, the woman didn't consider it to be that way in modern times. He also had a very distorted understanding of narcissism and seductiveness in women. Um, again, everything came back to not having a penis and this desire for a penis, and it seems almost comically obvious that penis was just a proxy for power. In that time, women did not have power over their lives, over the lives of their children. And, um, but Freud didn't, didn't seem to make this connection. Um, and I feel like a lot of it is summed up by this little quote in the picture. 
he said the greatest question that has never been answered is, what does a woman want? And <laughs> I think Freud was kind of uniquely unable um, to answer that. Other diversity issues within Freud's theories, there were significant cultural limitations of Freud's theories. They were developed pretty much entirely based on his personal history and his experience treating white Austrian upper-class women. Um, there have been some attempts to update his theories for other cultural groups, um, and I don't know much about how successful that has been. Um, but that might be worth looking into if somebody's interested in modern psychoanalysis. As well, Freud was, I kind of alluded to this before, Freud's theories were very heteronormative. He made no leeway for um, normative homosexual, bisexual, or um, kind of like pansexual behavior. Um, doesn't account as well for heterosexual children that were raised with same-sex parents. So a lot of his theories of psychosexual development are based on this idea that women have, uh, that, um, sorry, children have a um, male and a female parent. Um, and obviously this wouldn't, um, these theories wouldn't hold in children who have two parents of the same sex, but still uh, develop normally into happy, healthy adults. Okay. So um, moving on with Freud's theory of psychoanalysis, um, anxiety was a big portion of his theory. So the, the idea is that anxiety is any kind of painful affective experience, so pretty close to what we think of as modern anxiety, affective being like emotional. Anxiety is the byproduct of the formation of the ego and superego. So remember that the ego and superego form throughout childhood. Um, and there are, there's kind of a lot of um, psychological maneuvering that happens in order to um, uh, form these components of the personality. Um, there's anxiety from reality, which springs from real danger in the outside world. There's neurotic anxiety, which is the fear that the id's impulse will be expressed unchecked and lead to trouble from the environment. Um, so the kind of the idea that people will act on base impulses. And then there's the moral anxiety, which is the fear that um, a person won't conform to their own standards of the conscience. Ego defenses, you might have heard of these before. This was also um, a big part of Freud's theory. Um, so uh, these are also called defense mechanisms, and they're involuntary and come from fear. Um, a, a couple um, common ones are fixation, which is anxiety that... Um, about that next sex, psychosexual stage, um, which leads to stagnation in the current stage. So we talked about like um, oral fixation earlier. Um, somebody would be afraid of moving to the anal stage of psychosexual development. And so they would kind of um, uh, manifest in the oral stage and not move past that. Repression is um, keeping threatening materials out of consciousness. So if there are thoughts or memories that are too painful, somebody might repress them. Regression is when an adult goes back to a previous stage that offered gratification. So maybe if um, things are really difficult, um, th the idea was adult would kind of uh, regress back to a stage that they had already passed through, a psychosexual stage they had already passed through. Reactive formation is the unconscious impulse consciously represented by its behavioral opposite. So um, unconsciously having an impulse to act in a certain way and consciously acting in the opposite of that way. Projection is unconscious feelings about self that's attributed to another person. So a classic example would be like um, saying, uh, one person saying to another, you hate me, when in what they're really trying to express is that, um, is I hate you. Conversion is psychological conflict that's expressed as a physical symptom. So maybe um, uh, experiencing paralysis or um, severe illness due to psychological conflict. Displacement um, moves sexual or aggressive impulses to a more acceptable or less threatening target. So it's easier to deal with. And intellectualization is my favorite. Um, and that's concentrating on the intellectual parts of the situation in order to distance oneself from the anxiety provoking emotions. Um, uh, insight is an important part or aspect of 
psychoanalysis, this would be the total understanding of unconscious determinants responsible for a person's feelings, thoughts, behaviors, uh, and distress. Neurotic defenses and symptoms would disappear, ideally after, or hypothetically after achieving full insight. And all the techniques of psychoanalysis work to facilitate insight into unconscious feelings and behaviors. It's um, a working through process, so repeated examination of how conflicts and defenses have operated in different areas of somebody's life. Very slow, lengthy, very tedious, a lot of work. Three to five sessions per week for three to five years. So um, in this kind of pure psycho analytical style, therapy is um, very, very rigorously engaged in um, and takes a lot of time and resources. Another analytical technique is free association, and this uh, might be familiar to you. There's kind of the trope of like somebody sitting in a couch, just like saying whatever comes to their mind in a therapist's office. Um, a lot of my clients come in kind of expecting that um, in psychotherapy and are surprised when they're sitting upright in a well-lit room filling out worksheets. Um, but patients um, are supposed to say everything that comes to mind without censoring it. So anything even like ridiculous, embarrassing um, uh, thoughts that they think are bad, they should say it out loud. And it's believed to shed light on unconscious thoughts and urges. Uh, in the ideal setting, the psychoanalyst is sitting behind the patient um, and the patient sits on a couch. So um, this is just considered to be kind of an ideal setup because it's um, less distracting for free association. Uh, it's easier for the psychoanalyst um, and kind of facilitates more open communication. Dream analysis is a common psychoanalytic technique. It provides clues looking, so it's looking at somebody's dreams and kind of getting clues from the nature of their unconscious um, based on the belief that dreams are laden with unrealized wishes and unconscious desires. There's two parts of dreams to a psychoanalyst. There's the manifest content, so what actually happened in the dream, and then the latent content, which is the symbolic meaning of those events or characters in the dream. And um, this is the focus of dream analysis. A patient may be asked to free associate to a dream um, in order to cover, uncover that latent content. Um, and a psychoanalyst would have to be careful of waking defenses that kind of prevent the person from truly free associating about that dream. Resistance are any behaviors that prevent this unconscious material that's supposed to be being brought into consciousness from reaching consciousness. Um, and a variety of behaviors um, are considered or could be interpreted as resistance in psychoanalysis. So um, not being as engaged during the therapeutic session, leaving out information, talking a lot about um, easy or mundane topics, flattering the therapist, um, and canceling appointments or coming up with excuses, uh, coming to appointments late. It's essentially avoidance, but on an unconscious level. And um, the goal of a therapist, if they, are, if they see resistance, is to understand the function of that resistance, understand what it's protecting that person from, and encouraging the patient to address um, that resistance. Transference is when a patient would act um, toward the therapist as if they're an important figure from childhood. Um, it's kind of a way of childhood conflicts to be present in the therapy room. It could be positive or negative feelings. Um, and um, transference um, in the psychoanalytic belief could um, provide clues about the nature of a person's problem. So if um, a female patient was acting um, kind of childlike and um, angry with, uh, with a male therapist, this might be interpreted as transference of sort of her relationship with her father or a negative relationship with her father onto the therapist. Um, and that could provide clues about the patient's um, feelings toward her father. Um, and transference is something that can be interpreted for the patient um, or with the patient and discussed within the therapy room can also be a form of resistance. 
Interpretation is a technique in psychoanalysis, and it's the main method by which unconscious thoughts, the meaning and the um, function behind unconscious thoughts is revealed to the patient. So that's how um, insight is achieved. Um, it, so it's meant to open up the patient to new ways of viewing things. Interpretations are offered over time um, and are taken uh, often from comments or should be taken primarily from comments that the patient um, has, ha has said themselves. So um, it shouldn't be something um, that feels completely out of the blue or completely um, extremely distressing to the patient. It should be something that the patient's ready to hear. Um, if the patient, if it's too anxiety provoking, a patient would reject it. Um, so it's best to provide these um, interpretations in small doses um, to avoid overwhelming the patient or causing them to disengage or engage defense mechanisms. Uh, in psychodynamic therapy, uh, like uh, broadly, oh, 